the 25th. The emperor sent for me at about 4 o'clock. He had just finished working and appeared much pleased with the result of his occupations of the day. I have been busy with Bertrand all day on fortifications, said he to me, and the day has appeared to me very short. I have already said that this was a newly acquired taste of the emperor's quite at the moment, and such pastimes are valuable here, God knows. I had followed the emperor to the kind of grass plot which adjoins the tent. From thence we went to the corner of the walk that leads to the bottom of the garden. Five oranges were brought on a plate with a knife and some sugar. Oranges are very scarce in the island. They are sent from the Cape. The emperor is very fond of this fruit. They were present from Lady Malcolm. And the admiral never failed to send him some whenever he had any. We were three of us at this moment with the emperor. He gave me one of these oranges to put in my pocket for my son and proceeded to cut the others in slices and prepare them. And seated on the trunk of a tree, was eating them cheerfully and familiarly distributing part of them to us at the same time by a fatal instinct. I was precisely at that instant contemplating the pleasure of this momentary situation. Alas! Yes, I was far from thinking that I was then taking the last present I could receive from his hands. The emperor then took some turns in the garden. The wind had become cold. He went into the house again and bade me follow him alone into the drawing room and the billiard room, whilst he paced up and down the whole extent of the two rooms. He was talking to me again about the manner in which he had passed his day and asked me how I had spent mine. Then the conversation having turned on his marriage, he was speaking of the fetes which had taken place on that occasion and which had ended in the terrible accident that happened at Mr. Schwarzenberg's ball. I was listening and inwardly proposing to make an interesting article in my journal on this subject when the emperor suddenly interrupted his conversation to observe through the window a great number of English officers who were advancing towards us from the gate of our enclosure. It was the governor, surrounded by several of his staff. The Grand Marshal, who at this moment came into the room, observed that the governor had already been there in the morning and that he had been at his house and remained there some time. He added that a certain movement of the troops was spoken of. These circumstances appeared singular and marked the effect of a guilty conscience. The idea of my letter clandestinely sent immediately occurred to my mind and a secret foreboding instantly warned me that all these strange proceedings concerned me. Such, in fact, was the case. For a few moments after, a message was brought to me, informing me that the English colonel, the creature of Sir Hudson Lowe, was waiting for me in his own apartment. I made a sign that I was with the emperor, who, a few minutes afterwards, said to me, Go this causes and see what that animal wants of you. And as I was going, he added, And come back soon. These were, for me, the last words of Napoleon. Alas, I have never seen him since. But his accent, the tone of his voice still sounded in my ears. How often since have I taken delight in allowing my imagination to dwell upon them and what mingled sensations of pleasure and regret may be produced by a painful recollection. A colonel who wished to see me was a man entirely devoted to the governor's wishes, his factotum, and with whom I had frequently to communicate as interpreter. I had no sooner entered the room than, with an expression of benevolence and kindness, both in his voice and countenance, he inquired after my health with a tender interest. This was the kiss of Judas for having made a sign to him with my hand to sit down on the sofa and having also taken a seat on it myself. He seized this opportunity to place himself between me and the door. And altering at once his tone and expression, he informed me that he arrested me in the name of the governor, Sir Hudson Lowe, on the deposition of my servant, who had charged me with having carried on a secret correspondence. My room was already guarded by Tragoots. All representations on my part became useless. I was obliged to yield to violence and was carried away, strongly escorted. The emperor has since written, as it will be seen hereafter, that on seeing me from his window, hurried along through the plains surrounded by armed men, 
the alacrity of the numerous staff prancing about me, and the quick undulation of their high feathers floating in the air had put him in mind of the ferocious joy of the savage inhabitants of the islands of the Pacific Ocean dancing round the prisoner whom they are about to devour. I had been separated from my son, who had been detained prisoner in my apartment, but he soon joined me, also under arrest, so that the sudden interruption and final termination of our communications with Longwood date from that moment. We were both shut up in a wretched hovel near the former habitation of General Bertrand and his family. I was obliged to sleep on a miserable pallet and to make room for my poor son by my side, lest he should have to lie on the floor. I considered his life to be at this moment in danger. He was threatened with an aneurysm and had been on the point of expiring in my arms a few days before. We were kept until 11 o'clock without food, and when in order to supply the wants of my son, I went to the door and to each of the windows to ask the men who guarded them for a morsel of bread. And they answered me only by presenting bayonets. The 25th to 26th, what a terrible night, is the first night spread in prison within four walls. What ideas, what reflections arise in the mind? My last thought at night and the first unwaking in the morning had been that I was still only a few minutes walk distance from Longwood, and yet that perhaps I was already separated from it by eternity. In the course of the morning, the Grand Marshal, accompanied by an officer, passed within hail of my hovel. I was enabled to ask him from my dungeon how the emperor was. The Grand Marshal was going to the governor's at Plantation House. His visit was undoubtedly on my account, but what could be the object of his mission? What were the ideas and the wishes of the emperor on the subject? This occupied all my thoughts. On passing again on his return, the Grand Marshal, with an expression of melancholy, made a sign to me which gave me the idea of bidding me a Jew, and which went to my heart. In the course of the morning, General Gorgo and Monsieur de Montalon also came as far as the late residence of Madame Bertrand, which was opposite to my prison, and not far from it. It was consolatory to me to see and interpret their signs of friendship and tender interest. They in vain solicited to be allowed to come into my prison. They were obliged to return without having succeeded. Shortly after, Madame Bertrand sent me some oranges, informing me at the same time that she had just received indirectly some news of my wife and that she was in good health. These attentions, these demonstrations of kindness from all my companions were to me a proof that the first appearance of misfortune is sufficient to awaken the feelings of a family affection, and I found some consolation at this moment in being a prisoner. No time had been lost in my late apartment after my arrest. A police officer, a recent importation into the colony, and I presume the first attempt of the kind that had been made on British ground had made his first essay on me. He had searched my secretaire, broken open my drawers, and seized all my papers, and anxious to show his dexterity and the extent of his abilities. He had immediately set about undoing our beds and taking my sofa to pieces, and even spoke of taking up the flooring. The governor, having got possession of all my papers, now proceeded to produce them to me in triumph. He went into the late house of Madame Bertrand opposite me, followed by eight or ten officers, and said to ask me whether I would go over there to be present at the inventory which was to be made of them, or whether I preferred that he should come to me. I replied that since he left me the option, the latter plan would be the most agreeable to me. Everybody being seated, I rose to protest most positively against the indecorous manner in which I had been taken away from Longwood against the illegality of sealing up my papers in my absence and against the violation about to be committed on uh, my private papers the secret depositories of my thoughts which should exist for me only and which had remained to this day a secret to all the world i protested against the abuse that might be made of their contents by power i told sir hudson low that if he thought that the circumstances of the case required that he should examine them he must use his own discretion that I had no fear of the consequences, but that I owed to myself and the general principles to throw the responsibility of the act entirely upon him to yield only to violence and not to authorize it by my consent. These words uttered by me in presence of all his officers irritated the governor who exclaimed, countless causes do not render your situation worse than it is. 
It is bad enough already, alluding probably to the punishment of death, which he often reminded us of our being liable to if we assisted in endeavoring to effect the escape of the great captive. He concluded, no doubt, that my papers would produce the most important discoveries. God knows how far his ideas might go on that subject. Before Sir Hudson began to read my papers, he called General Bingham, the second in command in the island, to assist personally in their perusal. But that officer's ideas of delicacy differed entirely from those of the governor. Sir Hudson Lowe answered he with a mark expression of disgust. I beg you will excuse me. I do not think that I shall be able to read that kind of French handwriting. I had, in fact, no real objection to the governor's examining my papers, and I therefore told him, not in his capacity of judge or magistrate, for he was neither the one nor the other to me, but of my own accord, and out of pure condescension, I thought proper to allow him to read them. He fell immediately upon my journal. His joy and his expectations might be imagined when he perceived that it would inform him day by day of all that happened amongst us at Longwood. It was sufficiently in order to have a table of contents or index to the chapters at the beginning of each month. Sir Hudson Lowe, on meeting frequently with his name, would immediately refer to the page pointed out in the index to read the details. And I could not help observing to him that if he found it often necessary to use forbearance, it was not my fault, but the fault of his own indiscretion. I assured him that my journal was not known to anybody, that the emperor himself, who was the sole subject of it, I had only read the first pages of it, that its contexture was far from being settled, and that it was intended to remain for some time to come a secret known to me only. After Sir Hudson Lowe had spent two or three hours in looking over my journal, I told him that my intention had been to enable him to form a correct idea of the nature of its contents, and that having now done so, I felt bound for many reasons to prohibit as far as it was in my power his going any further, that he could, of course, do as he pleased, but that I should protest against the violence he would thus exercise, and the abuse of his authority. I could easily perceive that this was a great disappointment to him. He even hesitated. However, my protest produced its effect, and my journal was not touched again. I might have extended the protest to all my other papers, but I did not care much about them, and they were, during several days, most minutely examined. I had my last will sealed up. I was obliged to open it as well as other papers equally sacred, having got to the bottom of a portfolio containing some things which I had not ventured to look at since my absence from Europe. I was obliged to open them. This day was to be a day of emotion to me. The sight of these objects awoke in my breast some old recollections which my courage had stifled since certain painful separations had taken place. I was affected and obliged to hasten out of the room. My son, who remained in it, told me afterwards that the governor himself had appeared somewhat affected by this circumstance. From the 28th to the 30th, this day, the 28th, we have been removed from our wretched hovel to a kind of cottage belonging to Mr. Balcombe, our former host, Winnet Briars, and situated about a league distant. The house was small but very tolerable and situated opposite Longwood and at a short distance from it. We were only separated from it by several ridges of precipices and steep summits of mountains. We were guarded by a detachment of the 66th Regiment. Numerous sentinels watched over us and defended the approach of our prison. An officer was at our disposal, Sir Hudson Lowe obligingly said. And, as he affirmed, for our convenience, all communications were strictly intercepted. We were placed in a state of the most absolute seclusion. On the summit of the hills which surrounded the hollow in which our house was situated, there was a road on which we saw today General Gorgo, accompanied by an English officer. We could observe his efforts to come as near to us as possible, and we received with feelings of joy and affection the signs and demonstrations of friendship which our companion addressed to us from that distance and returned ours to him in the same manner. A kind and excellent Madame Bertrand sent us again some oranges. We were not allowed to write to her to thank her, and were obliged to confine the expression of our gratitude to sending her some roses which we had gathered in our prison.
the next day. So Hudson Lo came to see us in our new residence. He wished to know what kind of bed I had had. And I took him to the next room and showed him a mattress on the floor. The same kind of attention had been bestowed upon our food. I mentioned these things to you, said I, because you have asked me. But for my part, I do not care about them. He then grew very angry at the person to whom he had entrusted the superintendents of our establishment here and sent us our meals from his own table at Flotation House, although a distance of two leagues, and continued to do so until our wants were regularly provided for. It became necessary to devise some occupation in our new prison to enable us to bear the weight of time. I divided our hours so as to fill up our days. I regularly gave lessons of history and mathematics to my son. We read, and during our intervals of leisure, we walked about our enclosure. The place was agreeable enough for St. Helena. It offered some verdure and a few trees, a great number of fowls, which were being reared for the consumption of Longwood, were kept there, as well as some pintados and other log large birds, which we soon rendered tame. Prisoners are ingenious and compassionate. In the evening, we used to light a fire, and then I related to my son some family stories. I informed him of my family concerns and mentioned to him and made him take down the names of those persons who had shown themselves kind to me during the course of my life or had rendered me some service. In short, our life was dull and melancholy, but so calm that it was not devoid of a kind of pleasurable feeling. One day alone was exceedingly painful and haunted us continually. The emperor was there almost within sight, and yet we inhabited two distinct worlds. We were only separated by a short distance, and yet all communication had ceased. There was something horrible in this situation. I was no longer with him, and I was not with my family, which I had left to follow him. What then remained to me? My son shared in these feelings, urged by this situation and by the enthusiasm of youth, the dear boy offered to me in a moment of exultation to take advantage of the darkness of the night to elude the vigilance of our guards. Descend into the numerous precipices and scale the steep and numerous heights which separated us from Longwood, see Napoleon and bring me back some news from him, which he engaged to do before daylight. I calmed this seal, which even had it made the attempt practicable, would have produced no other result than to afford a feeling of personal satisfaction and might have occasioned the most serious consequences. The emperor had conversed with me so often and so fully that I did not suppose there was anything he might wish to inform me of and if the attempt made by my son had been discovered what a noise it would have made what importance would have been attached to it by the governor what absurd stories he would have imagined and produced from Sunday December the 1st to Friday December the 6th the days of our imprisonment were slowly succeeding each other and the governor although he continued to visit us frequently did not mention anything concerning our situation he had merely hinted to me that my residence in the island and my confinement might be protracted until instructions were returned from London eight days had nearly elapsed without producing the least approach towards any result whatever. This state of inactivity and passiveness could not agree with the nature of my disposition. The health of my son was at times most alarming. Deprived of all communication with Longwood, I was left alone to meditate by myself. I reflected upon the situation in which I was thus placed, fixed upon a plan, and took a resolution. I chose it extreme in its nature, thinking that if it was approved by the emperor, it might prove useful and that it would be very easy to retrace my steps if he wished it. I therefore wrote to the governor the following letter. Sir, in consequence of a snare laid by my servant, I was on the 25th Ultimo, torn from Longwood, and all my papers were seized for having infringed your restrictions, to which I had previously submitted. Had you trusted the observance of these restrictions to my word or to my delicacy, I should have considered them as sacred, but you chose to guard them by attaching penalties to their violation, and I chose to run the risk of encountering them. You have applied those penalties at your own discretion, and I have made no objection to it. All this, as far as it goes, is perfectly regular but the measure of punishment should not exceed the measure of the offense. What is now the case? Two letters have been delivered for transmission without your knowledge. 
One of them contains the relation of the events that have occurred to us, written for Prince Lucien, and which would have passed through your hands if you had not informed me that the continuation of my correspondence and the style of my letters would cause my removal by you from the person of the emperor. The other letter was merely a letter of friendship. However, this circumstance has placed all my papers at your disposal. You have seen them all, even to the most secret. I have myself so much facilitated your researches that I have consented to allow you to peruse solely upon your word that which was known only to myself, which is as yet a mass of undigested ideas, undetermined and liable at every moment to be corrected or modified. In a word, the secret, the chaos of my thoughts. In so doing, I have wished to convince you, and I appeal to your candor when I say that I hope I have convinced you that in the multitude of papers which you have hastily looked over, there is nothing that could be considered as tending to interfere with the high and important part of your functions. No plot, no plan, not even a thought relating to Napoleon's escape. You cannot find any, because none existed. We are of opinion that his escape is impossible, and we do not think of it. Yet, I will not deny that I should willingly have attempted to effect it had I seen the possibility of success. I should willingly have sacrificed my life to restore him to liberty. I should have fallen a martyr to my zeal, and my memory would have lived forever in all noble and generous hearts. But I repeat it, nobody considers the attempt practicable, and nobody thinks of making it. The Emperor Napoleon's plans and wishes are still those he formed when he repaired willingly and in good faith on board the Balrafan, that is, to go and seek for a life of tranquility in America, or even in England, under the protection of the laws. These points settled, I protest with all my might against your reading henceforward. I might say all my private papers, but I confine myself to what I call my journal. I owe it to the great respect which I entertain for the august personage whose name fills its pages. I owe it to the respect due to myself to state my solemn objection to your so doing. I therefore demand either that those papers may be immediately restored to me, if you think conscientiously that their contents are foreign to the grand objects of your administration, or if, from what you have read of them, you consider that certain parts should be laid before the British ministers, I demand that you will forward them all to England and send me with them. You, sir, are so often alluded to in those papers that delicacy imperiously commands you to adopt one of those two alternatives, you cannot possibly endeavor to avail yourself more than I have allowed you of this opportunity to read in them what concerns you personally, lest you expose yourself to the conclusions that will be drawn by induction from this abuse of your authority, lest the circumstance be thought connected with the trap laid for me and with the great stir that has been made about such a trifle. As soon as I shall have arrived in England with these papers, I shall ask the ministers in their turn. I shall appeal to the whole world whether any importance can be attached in the eyes of the law to a document recorded day by day with all the negligence warranted by strict privacy, the conversation, the words, and perhaps even the gestures of the Emperor Napoleon. I shall ask them particularly whether I have not a right to demand of them the most inviolable secrecy concerning every part of a journal, which is only the rough draft of my thoughts, which, properly speaking, does not exist, which contains only materials yet undigested, which I might without scruple disavow in almost every particular as being as yet far from being settled in my own mind, and in which it happened to me every day to have to correct by the tenor of a new conversation the errors of a former one, errors that must be unavoidable and a frequent occurrence, both with respect to the man who speaks without knowing that he is observed, and to the man who collects without considering himself bound to warrant the authenticity of his information. As for what concerns you, sir, in those pages, if you have frequently had occasion to complain of the opinions I have pronounced, or the facts I have stated, it is very easy to point out between man and man, the errors into which I may have fallen, you cannot possibly afford me a greater pleasure than by giving me an opportunity of being just. And whatever be the opinion in which I persist 
after your explanation, you will at least be obliged to acknowledge my candor and my sincerity. Be that as it may, sir, and whatever be your intentions with respect to me, I from this moment withdraw in as far as my present position will admit from the state of voluntary subjection in which I had placed myself towards you. When I entered into that engagement, you told me that I remained at liberty to retract it at any time, and I therefore from the present moment desire to be restored to the common class of citizens. I place myself once more under the operation of your civil laws. I appeal to your tribunals not to implore their favor, but to justice in the judgment. I presume, General, that you have too much respect for the laws and too much innate justice in your heart to make it necessary for me so far to insult you as to observe that you would become responsible for all the violations of the law that may be exercised against me directly or indirectly. I do not suppose that the letter of your instructions, which might induce you to detain me a prisoner here at the Cape during several months, could shelter you from the spirit of those same instructions, appealed to by the power, the superiority, the majesty of the laws, those instructions, if I have rightly understood them, in ordering you to detain every person having belonged to the establishment at Longwood during a certain time before you restore them to liberty, have only for their object, no doubt, to derange the communications that might have been held with that horrible prison and to let some time elapse after their station. Now the manner in which I have been torn away has been sufficient to attain that end. It was impossible for me to bring away any idea of the moment. I was, as it were, struck with sudden death. Besides, if I am sent to England under accusation and submitted to the operation of the laws, they will, if I am found guilty, sufficiently obviate the inconvenience which it has been sought to avoid. If I am not guilty, I shall still be exposed to the provisions of the alien bill. Or if that is not enough, I here give beforehand my voluntary assent to all precautions, however arbitrary they may be which it may be thought proper to adopt against me on this occasion. Without yet knowing, sir, what your intentions may be with respect to the disposal of my person, I have already imposed upon myself the greatest of all sacrifices. I am still very near to Longwood, and perhaps I am already separated from it by eternity. Horrible thought that harrows upon my soul and will continue to haunt my imagination. But a few days ago, and you would have brought me to submit to the greatest sacrifices, by the fear of being removed from the Empress person. Today, it is not in your power to restore me to him. A stain has been affixed upon me by arresting me almost within his sight. I can no longer be a source of consolation to him. He would only see in me a being dishonored, suggesting painful recollections, and yet his presence, the attentions which I delighted to pay him, are dearer to me than my life. But perhaps some pity will be shown to me from afar. Something tells me that I shall return, but by a purified channel, bringing with me all that is dear to my existence to assist me in surrounding with pious and tender cares, the immortal monument placed at the extremity of the universe and slowly consumed by the inclemency of the air and the perfidy and the cruelty of mankind. You have spoken to me, sir, of your own afflictions. You do not suspect you have said all oh, the tribulations with which you are assailed, but everyone knows and feels his own misery only. You do not suspect on your side, sir, that you keep Longwood covered with the veil of mourning. I have the honor. Let's causes. Correspondence being once established with Sir Hudson Lowe, I did not remain idle. The following day I wrote to him again to tell him that in consequence of my letter the day before, I now officially and in due form demanded my removal from St. Helena and my return to Europe. Next day after that, I took up the same subject and treated it with reference to my situation as affecting my domestic concerns. In my two preceding letters, I said to him, both relating to my political situation, I had thought it improper and unbecoming to introduce a single word touching my private affairs. But now that I consider myself as belonging once more to the mass of common citizens, I do not hesitate, as an accidental inhabitant of your island, to represent to you all the horrors of my private situation. You are aware of the dangerous state of my son's health, 
It must have been reported to you by the medical men ever since he has seen the dear and sacred tie which bound us to long with dissolved. All his ideas, all his wishes, all his hopes are ardently turned towards Europe and his disease will be increased by impatience and the power of imagination. Such is his physical situation, which renders my moral situation still worse, if possible. I have to contend at the same time against the feelings of my heart and the uneasiness of my mind. I cannot contemplate without a feeling of terror that I am responsible to myself for having brought him here and for being the cause of his being detained here. What should I answer to his mother who would ask me for her son? What should I reply to the multitude of idlers and others who, though indifferent to the circumstances, are ever ready to judge and condemn? I say nothing of my own health. It is of little importance in the midst of such emotions and such causes of anxiety. And yet I find myself in the most deplorable state, for since I have no longer before my eyes the cause which kept the faculties of my mind in action, my body sinks under the dreadful havoc produced by 18 months of struggles, agitations, and afflictions such as the imagination can hardly dwell upon. I am no longer near the august person for whom I cheerfully endured them, and I am nevertheless also separated from my family, whose absence has caused me so much sorrow. Deprived of both objects, my heart is torn between them. It wanders in an abyss. It can no longer endure it. I leave you, sir. To weigh these considerations, do not sacrifice to victims. I request you will send this to England to the source of science and of every kind of assistance. This is the first demand of any kind that I have made either to yourself or to your predecessor. But the deplorable state of my son's health overpowers my stoicism. Will it not awake your humanity? Several motives may tend to influence your decision. They are all contained in my letter of the 30th of November. I shall merely add here that an opportunity now offers for you to give a great and rare example of impartiality in sending thus to your ministers one of your adversaries.